I don't think I have to explain the current geopolitical situation in Europe right now to all of you with, you know, Russia having invaded Ukraine and the chilling effect that that has on the relationships between Europe and Russia and NATO. But of course, the Eastern European border that NATO has with Russia and the current conflict isn't the only potential area where a flashpoint can occur. In fact, over the last couple of years, the Arctic has become quite a well, contested environment where nothing really serious has happened just yet, but where there's a lot of potential for things to go south very, very quickly. Today, I want to talk about exactly this with Aaron Dawson, who is a PhD student at King's College and who also recently released an article on exactly this subject with the Freeman Air and Space Institute, talking exactly about sort of the challenges that NATO faces and how different actors like the United States and European countries currently prepare or think and conceptualize about the Arctic environment, which is an extremely challenging theater of operations, of course. So let's jump right into it. This conversation on military aviation history is made in cooperation with the Freeman Air and Space Institute, King's College London. So Aaron, to start this out, um, can you give us sort of an elevator pitch or a short summary of why would sh we should actually care about sort of the activity that's going on in the Arctic right now and potentially in the future? A lot of European um, militaries in particular have had exercises, have had activities, have indeed had military campaigns in the Arctic going back centuries. If you look at the UK case, uh, we've had contingents operating in that region since the Napoleonic Wars. So the idea that the Arctic has never hosted a military presence uh, really isn't the case. Uh, but what is different today uh, is an intensification of military activity uh, in the region, uh, driven on the one hand by NATO-Russia tension, uh, and on the other by the melting of polar ice uh, induced by uh, climate change. Uh, and that is really opening up new threats, uh, new vulnerabilities, primarily to the uh, littoral states uh, located there, so the membership of the Arctic Council, but it's also invited uh, opportunities uh, for um, other states that are looking to exploit some of the resources in the region. So you can take uh, China, for example, that has uh, considered the Arctic Ocean as part of its uh, polar silk road. Uh, it's indeed a self-designated uh, near-Arctic state, however, geographically contested uh, that term may be. So there are, you know, growing interest from uh, non-traditional players uh, in that region. And in tandem with the um, changes induced by uh, climate change um, from a purely geographic standpoint, uh, the ability to exploit some of these resources is turning the region into a more uh, militarily contested uh, domain. So we're not necessarily seeing uh, any flashpoints as such. There are some provocative uh, behaviours, um, but if you look at the expansion of uh, military infrastructure in the region, um, that is, you know, somewhat worrying. And put that uh, against the context of a deterioration in, in the relationship uh, with Russia as one of the biggest um, Arctic Council uh, members, uh, and also uh, the country with the largest uh, coastline in the region, uh, it is worrying for uh, commentators, analysts, uh, and indeed the military, uh, as to how to deal with these uh, two twin challenges of militarism in the Arctic uh, and also climate change. And, and let's look at sort of the geography then, because I think we all know where the Arctic is, but we don't exactly know where the, the bases are and where sort of the, uh, the uh, geographical points of interest are. So if we look at the map here, um, so pointing out here, of course, the red bases are the Russian bases. We have all the uh, NATO countries, well, Sweden soon to be, um, if we uh, get Turkey on board um, as, as a NATO country. Um, what are sort of the most important bases here and what is the Russian sort of uh, area of interest? From the NATO side, one of the most strategically important bases uh, is that of Tuldi in Greenland, and uh, as an airbase and deep water port, uh, it has historically been of uh, real importance to the US Air Force uh, and the US uh, Navy. Uh, today, uh, the US Space Force uh, operates the site, uh, which also serves as a key node in the North American uh, Aerospace Defense Command, uh, which provides uh, an early warning capability against uh, ballistic missiles 
Uh, so in sum, uh, it's the northernmost uh, installation in the US uh, military infrastructure and quite a substantial one at that. Uh, so it's a key base for the NATO side, uh, but importantly, uh, not on American soil. Um, Thule is um, part of, uh, as I say, uh, Greenland, which in turn uh, constitutes part um, of uh, the Danish kingdom. From the perspective of the Russians, um, a lot of its bases in the region are centered on the uh, Western Arctic. Uh, there aren't so many uh, in the Central or Eastern Arctic. Partly this is because uh, for them, uh, that's where the threat lies. Uh, it's European countries. Uh, it is uh, the North American continent. Um, so you do have uh, a sort of asymmetry in terms of the location uh, of these bases. In terms of the Western Arctic, they're primarily centered around the uh, Kola Peninsula. And this is because this is where uh, the Russian uh, second strike um, nuclear capability uh, lies. Russia has also upgraded its uh, military organization there to uh, its fifth military district. Um, so this is an elevation uh, of what had already uh, been uh, in existence there for a number of years, but it's uh, giving it a more formalized basis in order to project its power into that region uh, from, as I say, some of these key bases in the Western Arctic. And you already talked earlier about sort of also uh, China's role in, in like shipping routes or the Northern Silk Road. Uh, road. Um, is there anything else that, that sort of is in the Arctic that, especially nowadays with, with Ukraine, we've seen sort of potential sabotage of, of cables that are running on the, on the water as well. Is that also sort of a, a, an aspect where there could be a, a, an incident? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think there are uh, several particular vulnerabilities uh, from the standpoint uh, of, of NATO countries. Uh, you've touched on a really important one there, uh, undersea. Uh, data cables. Uh, we've got a new Prime Minister here uh, in the United Kingdom, Rishi Sunak, and uh, in previous writing he has said that the coordinated sabotage of these undersea data cables uh, constitutes an existential threat. Uh, and this is partly true because 97% of data transmitted around the globe uh, is sent through these cables uh, and that sort of amounts to $10 trillion worth of financial transactions daily. Uh, so there's, these really are strategic uh, choke points that lie in relatively vulnerable waters. Uh, a lot of the information about their location is freely available online, partly to uh, avoid uh, accidents taking place. But by doing that, you're also um, permitting potential adversaries into seeing, OK, where are your uh, vulnerabilities in a particular region uh, of interest. And we've seen uh, in recent years potential sabotage of data cables. So Svalbard is home to uh, one of the world's largest polar satellite ground stations. Uh, and we've had uh, the cables connecting um, uh, from uh, the Svalbard ground station to Norway being severed uh, in recent years. This sort of uh, reinforces this idea that uh, these these cables are vulnerable, particularly uh, if one considers the uh, Western response to, to Russia's invasion of Ukraine. This has really spurred on a, a drive towards um, energy independence. If you are going to build uh, a lot more offshore wind farms, you're going to need to connect them um, back to the national grid. And in particular, if you're relying on renewables, you've got to deal with variabilities in um, sunlight, in wind speed, uh, in rainfall. So there will be a tendency to interconnect uh, your national grid with those of nearby neighbours, hopefully allies, um, so that you can compensate for when your renewables aren't performing. So we're going to expect to see um, undersea uh, data cables grow. Uh, in, in density, particularly around uh, the Euro-Atlantic. So this is uh, something to watch out for. And then, of course, how can we not mention, um, you know, energy infrastructure, uh, oil and gas? Um, Russia certainly has the capabilities to tamper uh, with these sorts of systems. Uh, you have the Yanta-class intelligence vessel and you have the Belgorod mega submarine. Uh, both of these vessels have the capacity to uh, release a flotilla 
of mini submarines which can descend to depths uh, necessary to to tamper and sabotage with these um, elements of critical national infrastructure. Um, so there is a lot a lot going on in this space. And when you consider the Arctic is a region that isn't very well surveilled, uh, these risks are particularly acute. Considering all of this, what sort of cooperation is currently going on in NATO to to build up the capabilities? against potential you know, activity in the Arctic. I, I think the, in your paper you mentioned there was recently a um, cold response. Yes, indeed. So cold response uh, this year in 2022 has been one of the largest uh, exercises that have taken place uh, in, in Norway. And it comes off the back uh, really of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Uh, so it is a timely exercise in order to draw attention to alliance cohesion. Uh, but also to identify what are the deficiencies that we need to correct in the short term as Russia's um, invasion of Ukraine gives NATO members a temporarily, temporary reprieve uh, in terms of um, you know, recognizing the need to build back up its forces and potentially face uh, a Russian threat uh, in the future. That said, a lot of the cooperation in NATO uh, over the Arctic and, and the term used to refer to the wider region as encompassing the northernmost latitudes of the Euro-Atlantic is the high north. So these terms here are used somewhat interchangeably, but they refer to distinct um, ideas and concepts and geographies. NATO really hasn't engaged to the extent that it perhaps needs to. Um, partly this is um, because there are certain allies that are reluctant to see a bigger NATO presence uh, in the Arctic for fear of alienating Russia further, of provoking um, that country uh, even more. We've got to remember that Gorbachev called uh, the Arctic uh, a zone of peace. That's really what a lot of the uh, NATO countries still uh, want to promote. Um, the Arctic Council, which was set up um, in sort of the 1990s, was uh, a product of its time. Uh, it came about uh, at the end of the Cold War. Uh, you now have today um, soon to be seven out of the eight Arctic Council uh, members being also NATO allies. So we are really upping the stakes in terms of a potential uh, confrontation. Dialogue there has uh, been completely extinguished because those soon to be seven uh, NATO allies have um, boycotted the Arctic Council following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. But Canada is a country uh, which has um, sort of been, you know, one of these standout countries that has been reluctant to see NATO uh, further engage in the region. So if you look at NATO policy, they really do feature very little uh, mention of, of NATO's role uh, in, in that region. If you look at the um, latest strategic concept, it basically says that the high north is a region of crucial importance, but it doesn't go further. It doesn't say, OK, so what do we do about that? And this is really where um, you have informal groupings coming into play. Countries that see actually we are uh, within geographic proximity of this region. So you're seeing the emergence of, for example, the northern group uh, and the joint expeditionary force. A lot of these deal with Nordic uh, and Scandinavian countries who exercise uh, as a sort of informal grouping. You see, for example, the Americans leaning on to uh, Finnish expertise, seeing what they can uh, gain uh, from their experience um, over the past several decades. Uh, and I mean, talking about sort of the, the conditions that the Arctic has for military uh, operations, especially sort of from the air perspective, when we compare it to sort of traditional operations how does it really differ what makes this region beyond of course the the, the obvious you know the cold the, the temperatures and coming at this from a historian's perspective perspective looking at you know files from from the Luftwaffe operations on the eastern front during world war ii i can i can think i can start seeing sort of uh, the picture there but what but how would you sort of go about and explain like why are air operations so difficult up in uh, up in the arctic so the first thing that comes to mind is obviously the extreme cold this has implications for a, for a hardware perspective. Um, so you're dealing with perspex, which is more likely to crack. Uh, you're dealing with cables, which 
um, have a reduced uh, tensile load capacity. Uh, you're dealing with antennae which uh, don't perform uh, as expected. So a lot of these behaviours are unpredictable unless you actually operate uh, in the Arctic. Uh, a few years ago we had testing um, of the F-35 which found actually that a lot of the batteries that it had on board couldn't cope with the Alaskan cold. And if we think about potential contingencies in the Arctic, you're going to be there for a much longer period of time, potentially at more northerly at latitudes where the temperatures are even more severe. Um, so it does require a lot of testing to see on the basis of the current assets that we have, what is the likelihood that they're going to perform as expected under these extreme uh, cold conditions. But then of course, um, that extreme cold also applies to, to humans. And foremost amongst that is the ground crew who are exposed to this, uh, to these um, environmental conditions the most. So whereas spilling fuel on your skin in parts of Europe isn't so much of an issue, it can induce some pretty severe injuries uh, if you're exposed to the cold as well. So that wind chill factor um, as well because there aren't any sort of buildings in the way combined with the cold itself um, does make these injuries uh, pretty severe. So you do have to wrap up pretty warm. Uh, you have to know how to be relatively independent. Uh, we're dealing here with austere military infrastructure which isn't located to urbanized areas, to hospitals. Um, so those from that perspective um, that's you know pretty uh, crucial. There's also the psychological element so if you are ground crew um, or force protection, being able to deal with these on a day in, day out basis, whilst uh, only a small proportion of the Air Force is actually fighting, uh, is going to be uh, pretty tough. Uh, there, if you look at uh, the history of Air Forces uh, operating uh, in this part of the world, there is a tendency uh, and I should say not just among air, air forces, but amongst uh, militaries in general, there is a tendency to have a lot of people find in sort of ingenious excuses to work in, in headquarters uh, or rear base areas so that they can avoid being um, not only on the front line in terms of fighting the enemy, but on the front line in terms of uh, fighting the cold uh, and the weather. If you are a NATO air force that hasn't really trained in that region, that doesn't have battle hardened, environmental hardened, personnel watching how many of those people, notwithstanding their professionalism, uh, are seeking to find excuses to go into these uh, back areas is going to be uh, is going to be an interesting one. Then of course apart from the cold, um, the Arctic is a region that hasn't really been uh, developed uh, from an infrastructure perspective. So if you're a force protection uh, element seeking to defend some of the key, the few key airfields uh, in this part of the world, then you've got to be, you know, en encountering new issues like clearing snow drifts uh, off runways, uh, which you might do once in a blue moon uh, if you're stationed elsewhere in Europe, but this is happening on a, on a regular basis uh, in, in the Arctic and in the high north. Additional infrastructural issues arise from uh, what's called this polar satellite gap. So we see a lot of satellites that are in orbit, geostationary orbit, uh, low Earth orbit, um, but not too many uh, that are performing polar orbits. Now this is slowly beginning to change uh, with simply the increased interest in space as an operational domain. You are seeing a lot of uh, European nations that are developing um, northern, uh, northerly located spaceports, uh, and these are optimized really for, for polar for launching polar satellites and of course providing the, the ground stations that you need to uh, connect the data links uh, between those satellites and uh, the rest of the, uh, the force. Um, but at the moment as it currently stands um, the constellations operated by um, NATO allies um, in polar constellations are, are relatively minimal. Uh, and this has implications for things like uh, GPS. So um, a lot of uh, air uh, operations depend on accurate navigation, uh, whether that's um, precision targeting, whether this is 
uh, liaising with um, uh, you know, air-to-air -air refueling, uh, or if you're operating as part of a strike package, you need to know exactly where you are. Uh, but we see that uh, GPS um, and, for that matter, the alternatives, Galileo in Europe, for example, um, and uh, GLONASS uh, in the Russian constellation, they begin to degrade far earlier than you would potentially want them to uh, if you're conducting uh, particularly a, a combat operation uh, in the Arctic. Um, so from the perspective of, of that, um, you know, that's, that's a pretty um, severe condition um, to have to deal with. And then you have, sort of returning back to the sort of environmental uh, conditions here, the polar night. Um, so this is partly a vulnerability, but also an opportunity. Um, so six months of the year, you're dealing basically with darkness um, on a on a day to day basis, so how do you cope with that uh, condition? How do you, uh, from a psychological perspective, but then also if your air crew, how do you deal with the fact that um, you are basically operating in a in a perpetual night? Um, so you're going to need to have good night currencies in order to operate uh, in in during that time uh, of the year and in this part of the world. But the opportunity therein lies in the fact that uh, if you do want to uh, improve your, your night currencies, you have a decent chunk of time in which to do that. You don't have to wait for a few hours, perhaps, um, if you're in southerly latitudes, to wait for night to fall before you can begin to exercise uh, these sorts of proficiencies. You can spend uh, a few months, for example, in northern Norway, um, uh, exercising at night currency without having an antisocial impact. Um, so there are real opportunities um, there. And then, you know, a final issue that comes to mind when operating in this region in terms of the likely mission sets that uh, can be expected, we're dealing here uh, a lot with, um, potentially a lot with uh, naval assets. And if you think about naval assets, what do you have? Well, you have essentially a, a metal uh, tub with a lot of people inside, so a lot of confined spaces. If those uh, ships start uh, blowing up, you're going to deal with a lot of injuries. Where are they going to go? Well, you're immediately confronted with cold water. So the need to actually transport these sorts of people relatively quickly to hospitals uh, is going to be uh, really important. But not just from a sort of naval uh, military uh, standpoint, the number of um, people that are going on Arctic tourism, on uh, cruise lines uh, is increasing. These people really aren't uh, prepared for Arctic conditions. Uh, if you think about uh, the military not being unprepared, these are purely civilians who are going on a jolly ride uh, up to see um, up to see what the Arctic's all about. They are not prepared. So search and rescue uh, is going to become uh, much more important in this part of the world than it has. I mean, you, you've touched a lot of on the capabilities here that we that, that we need and that are required. Um, but considering that there are a couple of countries like Sweden and Finland and well, Canada, and Norway, that operate naturally in, in environments that are fairly close to what the Arctic has, um, you know, the US with, with Alaska as well, how prepared are we? What do we already have in terms of skill set and in terms of the equipment? And what do we, where, where is the priorities of what we need? If you look at the past, you know, certainly in the Cold War period, uh, a lot of NATO air forces did have pretty solid proficiencies in Arctic and cold weather warfare. Uh, following the end of the Cold War, that has uh, begun to degrade. We're starting to realise now that that deficiency exists. It's a deficiency that ought to be corrected. Um, but much of it is relearning what has been done uh, in the past. So from that perspective, uh, we can be optimistic. It's also true, as you point out, that a lot of, you know, Sweden and Finland is um, the two new uh, NATO allies that will be joining, as well as uh, Norway, which hosts the NATO Center of Excellence for cold weather uh, operations. These are countries that have a pretty long experience uh, dealing in this harsh climate and particularly given their geographic uh, location, operating in proximity to uh, Russia. So we can really draw on their uh, expertise in order to reverse the skill fade that a lot of 
NATO countries uh, have experienced uh, in recent years. In terms of um, you know where to, where to invest money from a capability uh, standpoint from from equipment uh, we're dealing here with pretty long ranges so if you look at the arctic uh, ocean um, it is london to the north pole for example is five times the combat radius of the f-35 so this is going to draw on uh, a lot of the uh, air-to-air refueling assets uh, that nato has uh, and this requires us to make sure that uh, these assets are compatible uh, with the assets that, that we're flying in that part of the world, uh, which isn't always the case. Um, so, uh, you know, making sure that we have enough assets, air-to-air -air refueling assets firstly, and then making sure that they're compatible with the aircraft. A real key deficiency across all NATO forces is maritime patrol aircraft. So we mentioned earlier the fact that um, Russia does have a pretty sophisticated submarine fleet, which can tamper with critical national infrastructure. But it's also the case that these submarines can contest NATO's freedom of action up until and potentially even beyond um, the Greenland, Iceland, uh, UK gap. And this is key because uh, if you're going to have Russian submarines that can uh, enter through the gap, they can go forth and menace uh, the replenishment and reinforcement convoys um, that would be traversing the transatlantic. So how can you deal with that? Well, um, part of the answer is to have uh, more maritime patrol aircraft. In the Cold War, we had twice as many MPA uh, as we did uh, submarines. Now, uh, the inverse is true. Um, it's you know fair to say that a lot of the MPAs that we have procured are more capable uh, but then so are the submarines uh, that we're having to face. So there is a delicate balance there to be made between uh, how much to invest uh, in, in MPA assets, how much to invest in naval assets in order to, to deter, constrain and potentially engage uh, the submarine threat um, posed uh, by Russia. So air-to-air -air refueling uh, and MPA assets are key. But then also, uh, if you are operating in this domain, you really do need to make sure that command and control systems are resilient uh, and that they're intact. And this also applies to precision navigation and timing through constellations such as GPS. If you've looked at Russia's behavior in the region in recent years, it is pretty provocative. So they've engaged in GPS jamming um, during NATO uh, exercises. Um, this is you know, simply worrying from a, from a human standpoint. Uh, you have had uh, in cold response exercises, for example, um, aircraft and, and personnel from the Royal Norwegian Air Force uh, and also uh, this year uh, the US Marines dying in accidents. Um, so having Russia um, jamming uh, GPS really isn't uh, helpful uh, to, to the situation. Part of the answer uh, that many people suggest is we'll just have more um, remotely piloted aircraft systems or drones in the region, that's going to do a lot of the work. Uh, they can um, be used as sort of a leg uh, in, in data links. Uh, they can be used for surveillance. And that can be true in a lot of cases. Uh, it can even be true in, in, in much of the Arctic. But to rely on these sorts of unmanned systems, uncrewed systems, really is giving them too much uh, agency. These systems are, as many of the manned aircraft are, vulnerable uh, to the environmental uh, conditions, but with the added effect that you, you don't have a human on board in order to control that. You don't have that last um, link really in the, uh, in the redundancy chain as you would with, with crewed platforms. And then of course, a lot of these uh, unmanned aircraft depend on a system of systems approach so that's going to likely uh, in turn depend on contractors. And then you have questions about, okay, what is the legal status uh, of these contractors in the region? How do you get them there um, to a remote part of the world relatively safely? So there are a whole host of questions associated with using uncrewed platforms in this part of the world that really questions the assumption whether they are uh, a universal solution uh, to our troubles. And, and sort of as a, as a big question regarding this, this cooperation and these capabilities that have to be built up, 
what is the role sort of of a single actor versus this that this requires sort of a uh, an approach by all NATO members to go to uh, go at it together? Is there anything that say a country like Norway, the United Kingdom, or the United States can do unilaterally in overcoming certain of these challenges and just um, you know with the US for example compensating for a certain deficiency in other uh, members or does it really require everybody to make that full out effort? One of the realities that we have to face is that no one country can operate um, to the level that we would need to potentially face uh, Russia and a lot has been uh, written in recent years of the underperformance uh, of the VKS uh, and the Russian military uh, writ large, I think it would be complacent of us to say that Russia isn't going to learn from this process at all. Um, and even if um, Russia ultimately fails uh, in its um, mission in Ukraine uh, and brings down Putin, um, given that his survivability is really tied to the outcome of the war, there's no guarantee that a future incarnation of, of Putin, his successor, whatever, is going to be more accommodating uh, of, of the new um, NATO countries that have formed along uh, his border. And we're going to need to make sure that whatever NATO can field um, is strong enough. Uh, it's strong enough from the point of deterrence. It's strong enough uh, from the point of potentially war fighting uh, against uh, Russia in that context. And if we look at the uh, set of NATO uh, Arctic capabilities, no one country really has uh, the capability uh, in order to single-handedly uh, defeat that. This is particularly salient if you consider uh, China's uh, behavior. So if uh, China uh, seeks to exploit uh, a NATO-Russia uh, contingency by launching its own attack, whether that's on Taiwan, or the first island chain or, or anywhere else, uh, then you're going to have a lot of US uh, resources diverted to the Indo-Pacific. Mentioned earlier about this uh, air air to air refueling uh, deficiency, you know, that problem is going to become much more acute if you have the vast bulk of um, US air tankers diverted to justifiably deal with the intercontinental ranges uh, of that part of the world. So if you Consider uh, that context, what can single uh, nations provide? While the UK, I think, has promise uh, in acting as a framework nation, uh, it has been leading uh, the joint expeditionary force uh, of northern European countries and then also uh, the northern group uh, as well. They have slightly different memberships, but by and large, they are composed of uh, northern European countries, Scandinavian, Nordic countries, uh, many of whom, like um, Norway, Sweden and Finland do have particular expertise uh, in cold weather operations. But what um, the UK can do is really provide uh, a leadership role, uh, exploit its uh, convening power in order to get these nations across the table, as they have been doing uh, in recent years to their credit. Um, but learning from each other is key, uh, making sure that um, these newer NATO members offer uh, basing, uh, offer infrastructure uh, for exercises to take place. Uh, Finland and Sweden have been somewhat uh, reluctant in this regard. Uh, they, you know, a step towards NATO membership is, is a big issue for them. Uh, and the last thing that they would want to do is be too complacent and bite off more that they can chew by offering, you know, NATO uh, a permanent forward presence uh, in that part of the world. Um, so, basing question mark, uh, but definitely exercises. This is something uh, that, um, you know, single uh, nations can can provide that would be very valuable. Another opportunity is country pairings. So we see this along NATO's eastern flank. And the benefits of this are that you are more familiar with um, the terrain, uh, with the people, the type of training. You know, there are some potential constraints. Uh, we spoke about the Thule base uh, earlier on. Greenland has a sort of modest independence movement. Uh, Scotland has a, a slightly stronger one. And therefore, there is a lot of political uncertainty that really is going to dictate how much um, a lot of these countries, particularly those that aren't traditional uh, Arctic players, can really uh, contribute to uh, this region.
And to bring this sort of full circle to the beginning of our conversation, um, you know, the, the relevance right now, we have the war in Ukraine, we have the shift or uh, to the Indo-Pacific, uh, especially with the US and uh, considering the situation between China and Taiwan. Um, where does the Arctic really factor into this? I mean, we, we know it's a relevant theater, but how much or how many of the resources can really be uh, invested there? And is there really sort of the political will? You mentioned earlier that it, you know, the region was identified as, as, as a crucial point of interest, but where do we stand really on getting these countries united and saying, we're going to try to, uh, to invest into countermeasures against potential Russian actions in the region? It really is a tough one because clearly the Indo-Pacific is rising in, in geo-economic importance. And that is drawing a lot of political will and attention and capital to that part of the world. That's entirely understandable. The question is whether particularly NATO, um, European NATO uh, member states have the capacity to actually uh, provide credible security guarantees to that part of the world when there are um, you know, significant doubts over their capacity to do so at home uh, in the Euro-Atlantic. That is really the question, the reality that policymakers have to confront with. Uh, you can contribute to Indo-Pacific uh, security through the Euro-Atlantic. You don't have to be in that uh, part of the world. We mentioned at the beginning sort of China uh, and China's designation as a near Arctic state. By making sure that um, the Arctic Ocean uh, remains uh, sort of an international waterway as it, op as it opens up. Uh, there are a lot of uh, legal uh, battles going on at the moment, various territorial claims overlapping, including of the North Pole. Uh, Russia is seeking a, um, you know, to impose its own transit protocols uh, on uh, ships that are using uh, the Northern Sea Route. And, and this Northern Sea Route is actually going to be pretty important for, for China. Uh, because it allows it to uh, evade some of the vulnerabilities that exist um, in its current uh, routings, uh, but also it significantly reduces the transit time uh, needed to, to ship from China. But ultimately, it does uh, come down to uh, the risk appetite. I think uh, one of the benefits in as, you know, whilst we have a lot of European uh, countries having Indo-Pacific strategies, I think one of the benefits in their present uh, sort of ambiguity is the fact that you can scale back and forwards uh, relatively easily. Another issue that we perhaps didn't have even a year ago is the fact that um, we do have a lot of constraints on uh, defence spending. So uh, Germany triumphantly uh, announced that they were going to uh, expand its defence budget. Um, we'll see uh, if that turns. Um, we will see indeed. You know, we will see indeed whether that turns rhetoric into action. The UK has had a, a brief flirtation with increasing, um, you know, going beyond above and beyond the NATO commitment to increasing defence spending up to three percent of GDP by 2030. That, uh, in the recent autumn statement, seems to have been scaled back. So, if you consider actually the fact that. Uh, NATO defence budgets aren't going up. It does require politicians to be really spending a lot of time prioritising, considering what parts of the world they actually see security interests in. And then within that budget, finding that optimal balance between spending on platforms, which is important, but also, as we've seen uh, in the case of um, Russia and Ukraine, actually a lot of your capability relies on, uh, you know, things that you can't really measure, like doctrine, uh, like morale, um, even uh, if you consider logistics. I'm going to be linking people to the article that you've written and that was published by, by the Freeman Air and Space Institute. So it's uh, obviously Aaron Dawson's cold comfort, the challenges facing the RAF's return to the Arctic. Is there any sort of specific recommendation beyond that yet that you would say, like, you look at this governmental paper or this publication by NATO, we'd say that's really the, the standout uh, sources that people should consult right now to get an overview of where we stand? I think a lot of the work by Duncan De Pledge uh, is, is really good. We've had, uh, you know, the privilege this year of, of seeing some uh, 
quality reports come out of uh, Rusi uh, and Civitas looking primarily at uh, the, the order of battle uh, in, in, in Russia versus NATO uh, and also uh, China uh, and how its uh, military is developing uh, in that context. Some of the local journalists uh, in the region are producing some quality output uh, it, almost in real time. So we have the Barents Observer and High North News uh, as really being a good quality um, uh, outlets uh, that you can uh, rely on. I think in terms of historical context, uh, a lot on the um, Winter War has been studied uh, this year uh, in, lots, in lots of government departments. Um, so taking a look at uh, World War II uh, and in the Cold War, how NATO uh, air forces in particular have, have dealt um, with the Russian uh, air threat in the Arctic uh, is, is key. Um, and then thinking about operating at range from austere uh, bases, uh, the Falklands, uh, which uh, has its 40th anniversary this year, uh, is another example of sort of a historical context uh, and what we can learn from it. Fantastic. Aaron, thank you very much for sharing your expertise and uh, hope to see you on the channel very soon again. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. Big thank you to patrons and channel members who make this content possible. Make sure to check out the description for all the recommendations that Aaron has given for your reading pleasure. And as always, have a great day and see you in the sky.